Only one. Welcome to the Trauma Series Zone Indian Orthopedic Association. Today is 24 July 2022. Sunday. The topic for today's webinar is injuries around the ankle joint. The guest chapter for today's webinar is Andhra State Association. And soon the state dignitaries will be joining us. Meanwhile, may I call upon the president of Web Zone Indian Orthopedic Association, Professor Dr. Adina, to say a few words. Over to you. Sir. Thank you, Abhishek. Dignitaries of IOA, respected guest of honor, chairman of Trauma Society, Dr. Sushrut Babulkar. Renowned orthopedic trauma surgeon from Nagpur, IOA Vice President Dr. Ram Chadda, Secretary Dr. Naveen Thakkar, and my team members of West Zone IOA. President and Secretary of Maharashtra and Gujarat, Dr. Vasudev Gadugane, Dr. Narayan Karne, Dr. Goin Purohit, and Dr. Kamle Dev Morari and all respected faculty members, good evening and welcome to fifth webinar of Wedge Zone of Indian Orthopedic Association. We have Andhra Pradesh Orthopedic Association with us today. I welcome President Professor Dr. Dharmara Vishaka Patanam and Secretary Dr. Naresh Babu, a renowned spine surgeon from Guntur. Thank you for support and participation in CME. We had interesting discussion on the injuries around knee, hip, shoulder joints, and open injuries in the past few weeks. I have really enjoyed and we learned through the interactions. Today, we are going to discuss another important topic that is injuries around the ankle. As we are all aware, ankle joint injuries can give nightmare to the surgeon in terms of outcome and functional recovery. Hence, it is very essential to identify the injury as well as to plan and execute proper treatment and surgical protocol for these cases. We have excellent panel to discuss the issue. I am sure this is going to be interesting discussion with our coordinators and esteemed faculties who all are eminent surgeon and master in foot and ankle with wide experience. Dr. Susrut Babulkar, Dr. Abhishek Kini, Dr. G. Santosh Ram, Dr. Pradeep Munot, Professor Dr. Sivanand, Dr. Sampat Dumre Pati, and Dr. Vikas Agashe. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Abhijit and Dr. Ashish for well, for well organizing and coordinating the session. And thank you to team Artho TV, Dr. Sham Ashok and Neeraj Bijlani for their collaboration. Thank you, everyone. And over to Abhijit. Thank you, Dr. Shindek, sir, for uh, those words. Next, may I call upon Professor Dr. Sushrut Babulkar, the President of Trauma Society of India, who is based in Nagpur and is an accomplished trauma and a joint replacement surgeon. Uh, over to you, sir. Sir will be uh, giving us how to successfully manage orthopedic trauma. That's his uh, first talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, West Zone Indian Orthopedic Association chapter to invite me as president of Trauma Society of India. I deeply appreciate uh, Professor Dr. Ajit Shinde, sir, and Abhijit Kale to invite me over. Trauma Society of India, which was formed almost around 17, 18 years back, 
and created a niche by organizing various conferences. Tromocon Mumbai has become a major game changer. If we all remember 15 years back, it was only joint replacement associations and arthroscopy associations, of course, Spine, Elizara and uh, other associations which were given uh, a lot of importance and trauma was looked as if any general orthopedic surgeon can handle it. No specific training is required, but TraumaCon and Trauma Society of India has been partly responsible for creating a niche in terms of training young orthopedic surgeons to take up trauma as a specialty. Trauma has become a well-known specialty amongst orthopedics now, which needs a formal training, needs a formal attendance of conferences and workshop and face-to-face -face events. Of course, webinars like this will stimulate the ideas, but it is face-to-face -face meetings and workshops and cadaveric dissection uh, workshops, which has helped trauma, which has helped young orthopedic surgeons to deal with complex fractures very effectively. I thank all of you again to be here as a part of this webinar. I am sure uh, next few hours will throw and stimulate uh, the thought process in management of complex trauma around ankle. And of course, I welcome all of you to attend trauma call, which is coming up in next few weeks in Mumbai as always. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you, Professor Dr. Sushrut Babulkar for those encouraging words. So basically what Sir has done is he has highlighted the importance of teaching in the, uh, orthopedic trauma. Whenever we see come across any case or a fracture, we feel as if that we can manage it. But only when we get stuck on the table, then we realize probably it was not a piece. Probably we should have been better prepared for this case. So rather than going through such a learning curve, it's better to have an insight into our skills and keep attending, keep improving our skills. So we move over to the scientific session of this uh, webinar. The first scientific talk is again by uh, Dr. Sushrut Babulkar, and he's going to tell us what are his indications for fixation of posterior malleolus and what is the best way to do it. Over to you, Professor Babulkar. Excuse me, Babulka, sir, please unmute. Babulkar, sir. Yeah, Dr. Babulkar, sir, we can't hear you. Hello, am I audible? Can you see me now? Can yeah, you correct. hear me now also? Now, now right. we can hear you. Now audible and we can very okay. well see your presentation okay. also. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks again, West Zone IOA, uh, to invite me over in this trauma series uh, to dwell upon injuries around ankle. My topic is posterior malleolus. What are the current thoughts? So if we really go and see, they, these are the commonest four clinical situations which we as orthopedic trauma surgeons encounter. Let's focus on A, which is a very tiny fragment and we always thought in terms of percentage to deal with this. So we always used to think that 25%, 50%, 75%, how much is the articular surface involved? So this was a very tiny spicule. And we always thought that this does not need any kind of internal fixation and going aggressively. Let's move on to a little bit of more uh, involvement here. Again, less than 25%. I may say it's around 15%. Again, we always thought that this also does not need any uh, surgical intervention. 
as we moved on to more involvement of article surface uh, 25 to 40% always confused us whether we should fix them or we should not be fixing them but then when it became very obvious that it's a huge chunk causing a uh, huge subluxation of the ankle and uh, the whole posterior valus is responsible for creating instability at ankle level we of course fixed it let's look into all these four permutations and combinations what are the current thoughts today is it based on percentage involvement or is it based on anatomical location ligamentous soft tissue involvement around ankle especially on the posterior part of uh, lower fourth of tibia so let's look at that posterior valvulus fracture occurs uh, it's not very uncommon it's 7 to 44 percent of uh, total ankle fractures uh, isolated posterior valvulus fracture has been uh, discussed and uh, described so that's a typical isolated posterior valvulus fracture before reduction uh, if you go back to uh, history uh, cooper in 1822 way back and henderson in 1932 uh, talked about uh, instability of ankle talked about posterior malleolus and they uh, and we all know this very well if we see a double contour sign in ap we should think of lateral and we should uh, look at how much uh, instability that fragment is creating so the size of posterior lateral fragment was uh, given a lot of importance in the literature in the past the percentage of vertical surface but as we uh, looked at and as we understood the city and as we understood uh, the soft tissue attachments soft tissue uh, around ankle especially on the posterior part of ankle and with advent of understanding of soft tissues we also understood that even the tiniest spicule can create a humongous amount of instability so it is not about percentage of articular surface involvement but the location of that fragment with the posterior lateral ligament so let's look at this so type 1 is the posterior lateral oblique fracture which is this and that's the most important area on the posterior part of tibia which can cause instability type 2 can be of various types transverse medial extension is the most horrifying uh, of the um, fracture configuration and type 3 even with shared type but because it is involving the important ligament that can cause instability let's look at how it can cause instability so this is uh, haruguchi's classification type 1 which is 24 percent type 2 which is 16 percent of the armamentarium type 3 is very rarely seen but this is the ligament which i am talking of that's the posterolateral oblique ligament which spans from tibia to fibula which is very very important in creating stability of the tibiofibular uh, syndesmosis posteriorly of the ankle despite of the articular surface involvement so if if we go medially because there is no um, ligamentous attachment of course we need to fix it but if there is a tiny fragment on this portion we need not or we can afford to neglect it but the moment we go in this posterior lateral area of tibia because it is with this ligament even a tiny shell type of a fragment can cause instability can cause ankle subluxation can trigger early uh, ankle arthritis and so it is important to identify the location identify whether the ligament is attached to the fragment and then effectively fix it so as to avoid later changes so clinical decision making using a ct scan using ct tomograms and then also of course some people prefer a 3d ct reconstruction is important internal fixation of posterior fragment comprising of 25 to 33 percent of tibial platform so it is a major chunk of the ankle fracture whole scenario so type one this is the classification which is most commonly uh, 
followed all over the world is the extra incisural fragment with intact fibular notch, 8%. Type 2, intra incisural posterolateral fragment involving one fourth to one third of fibular notch. And this is the highest percentage that we will come across in our clinical scenario, 52%. Type 3 is again intra incisural posterior medial two part fragment involving the posterior part of fibular notch laterally and posterior colliculus medially. It's, so this is the typical flake fragment that you will see on the lateral and you will see also on CT tomograms. So you will see a flake fragment, which is, uh, which we have been talking about uh, traditionally and type four, 9% or 10% is a large posterior lateral triangular fragment carrying the posterior half of the fibular notch which we always traditionally conventionally thought that this is the only thing which needs to be fixed wrong. We do not depend on articular surface percentage anymore, but I am repeating myself again and again. It is the location of the posterior lateral fragment along with the ligamentous attachment, which will cause instability, which will need to be surgically attacked and fixed. So going back to our scenario, when we thought that type A, type B, and type C, probably because of their Sir, is there a problem, sir? Hello? Sulkar, sir, you are muted, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure, we cannot hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry for that. Uh, major Nagpur range and creating network havoc. So type two variants can be triangular or, or, or uh, the fibula walking out of tibiofibular joint. Uh, this can be type two variants as seen also on CT tomograms and has to be identified on CT tomograph. So recent concept is fixation of posterior bellulus irrespective of the size to reduce. Posterior lateral uh, incision is the workhorse for this. Prone position is what is I preferred. Uh, go down, identify the nerve. Very easily you can reach the tibia. You can, you have to uh, temporarily fix the tibia and then go ahead uh, with assessment of how you have reduced the uh, posterior malleolus, you should not fix the fibula first, otherwise the fibular fixation plate can overlap the articular surface of the medial uh, of the uh, posterior malleolus. So once you have temporarily stabilized uh, the posterior malleolus, go on the fibula, temporarily stabilize the uh, fibula and then come back and fix the posterior malleolus. Here I have used uh, a maxillar uh, reconstruction plate as such, and then uh, fixed with another accessory uh, po posterior anterior screw like here, and then gone on the uh, fibular flat surface, which is located posteriorly and fix the fibula posteriorly, which is the flatter surface by another reconstruction plate. Now watch the reconstruction plate. If I would have fixed Fibula first, it would have come in the way of articular surface of posterior malleolus, rendering my assessment of articular surface reduction difficult. So that's the final fixation. Medial malleolus remains. That's the last of it. 
and then you have attained uh, this particular uh, situation of reconstructing the trimalleolar fracture by a posterior lateral approach and percutaneous fixation of medial malleolus by malleolus screw if a lot of combination is present fibula reducing and fixing fibula first may allow to restore length so either you can uh, span the fibula which will automatically push your posterior malleolus into reduction you can use multiple k wires to hold that reduction and span the fibula to length and then go and fix the posterior malleolus and go back to uh, fibula again for a definitive reduction or you can use a spanning fixator tiny fixator on the fibular side if there is a comminution and then fix medial malleolus or posterior malleolus and then go back to uh, fibula avoid placing hardware in the posterior tibial tendon groove that's important syndesmotic stability must be checked in fluoroscopy couple of quick example this was a compound injury very commonly seen in our country medial and laterally so rendering my immediate internal fixation difficult after few days of spanning fixator we can go ahead and fix the uh, uh, malleolus at a suitable time you can go ahead and fix this uh lateral malleolus which was treated only by uh, k wires and fix that with a uh, lateral conversion to plating posterior surface is a flatter surface of fibula so that's the preferred surface where you can place your plate that just to uh, remember that that is the preferred way and posterior lateral is the workhorse so you can easily uh, approach your fibula from the posterior side again a compound grade 2 fixator spanning uh, and caring for the wound till it allows you uh, to go ahead with a definitive fixation is the way to go but please do a limited internal fixation otherwise reducing tibial plafon and reducing this trimalleolar especially migrated proximally migrated posterior malleolus can become tricky and then of course you can go few months down the line and do a uh, definitive fixation as here tibial plafond very effectively treated by fixator but only fixator and minimal internal fixation can give rise to such mal union and early arthritis so that is not a preferred way today so what you want to do is want to internally fix this and uh, prefer a posterior anterior screw rather than antero posterior screw because we don't want to have uh, a birbal ki khichdi kind of situation go where the gold is so posterior anterior screw is the preferred fixation today so posterior plate <coughs> has to be as low as possible posterior fixation even the tiniest fragment needs to be fixed as is here pre op x ray again a trimalleolar fracture do a ct uh, assessment ct reconstruction ct tomograms to assess the location of the fragment so that's the ct tomogram it has shown you on the right bottom picture where the posterior lateral fragment is located because it's a posterior lateral fragment near fibula you are sure that it is creating a havoc in terms of instability because the ligament will be attached here posterior lateral as we have discussed is the workhorse reduce fibula it will automatically push <coughs> posterior malleolus into position temporary fixation of fibula definitive fixation of posterior malleolus go back to uh, posterior malleolus again uh, sorry uh, fibula again and fix the fibula as is here the wrong thing is assess the length of fibula assess the tip distal tip of fibula and push this anatomical plate as low as possible so fibular plate has to be as low as possible articular surface <coughs> has to be reconstructed well so another uh, last example of trimalleolar fracture instability assess the instability on ct scan intraoperative x rays go all around the globe of ankle don't see only ap don't see only lateral but see 30 degrees 45 degrees obliques also rushed nail or a thick k wire is an effective way of treating fibula if it is non comminuted 
and that's six months down the line. Trimalleolar fracture, CT scan, 3D reconstruction, effective fixation, internal fixation is the way to go. That's six weeks down the line with a very stable ankle. If we go and fix the fibula, irrespective of the size of articular surface. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Babokar, sir, for a wonderful talk. Let's have a question on this talk. Sir, I have a question for you. Yeah. What is your implant of choice, of your plate of choice to fix the posterior malleolus? To fix the posterior malleolus. Okay, yes. now the, there are various uh, anatomical plates also available. But a T plate that we use for uh, distal radius is very effective. And that's my preferred choice today. Very cheap, very easily available. Uh, and that should be the uh, choice for posterior malleolus. And a uh, routinely used reconstruction plate is good enough to be placed posteriorly for lateral malleolus or fibula. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah, sir, so you prefer for fixing it using a single incision or two incisions? Single incision, postal lateral. Postal lateral, fine. We have been joined in by the Honorable Secretary of the West Zone Indian Orthopedic Association as well as the Honorable Secretary General of the Indian Orthopedic Association, Dr. Navin Thakkar, sir. Dr. Thakkar, sir, do you have any question on this talk? No, no, no. I do not have any question. Only thing that Dr. Susrut has already mentioned everything. The size of the posterior malleolus does not matter. The instability does matter. So that was the message I think Dr. Susrut has given, I think. Absolutely. Yes, yes, sir. We have also been joined in by a senior orthopedic surgeon from Mumbai, Dr. Vikas Agashir, sir. Dr. Agashir, sir, any questions on this topic? I guess we are unable to connect to him. No issues. Uh, we have also been joined in by Professor Dr. Dharma Rao, who is the president of uh, the... Uh, Hello. 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 Yeah. I take welcome, this... Welcome, 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 President Sir Dharma Rao. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. So, good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Sir, uh, we would like to have a quick welcome message from you for all the online delegates who are listening to this webinar. Over to Professor Dr. Dharma Rao, who is the President of Orthopedic Surgeons Society of Andhra Pradesh. Over to you, sir. First of all, I thank you, sir. I thank you very much to the IVA of West Zone, and I thank you very much to the Professor Dr. Srivastava, uh, especially uh, direct. And Dr. Ram Chadda, Vice President, and Dr. Navin Thakkar, Secretary. He is really very, I am very fortunate to participate. And this TME is really very interesting and very good. And uh, it is uh, well oriented, well, well enlightened to all the uh, learners. A wise man will wisely serve. That's how they, we learn so much from this CME. All the secrets can be learned from the injuries. I am very happy to participate in this CME, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Dharma Rao, for joining in and for those kind and encouraging words. We move over to the next talk of the webinar, which is by none other than my friend, Dr. Abhishek Kini, who is an accomplished foot and ankle surgeon. And he is going to speak on the concepts of fixation in ankle fractures and how not to miss the injuries around it. Over to you, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit Kare. Uh, thank you, IOA. Thank you, MOA. So without wasting any more time, uh, we will be uh, talking about concepts of ankle fixation. So we know ankle fractures anatomically. There are injury to the bones and or on ligaments. Medially, there is the medial malleolus and the deltoid complex. That's number one. Laterally is the lateral malleolus and lateral ligaments third anterior tubercle of or the chaput tubercle on the tibia and posterior tubercle or posterior syndesmotic ligaments. So these are the four, as Dr. Babulkar said, a global ankle, uh, globally ankle is made up of these things. So ankle has two columns, 
medially the medial column and the deltoid deltoid has three parts of superficial and deep parts laterally there is the lateral marrulus lateral ligament syndesmotic syndesmotic ligaments which is the aitf and interosseous and pitf so if you understand ankle an ankle stability as a ring which comprises which comprises of both the malleolar deltoid and the syndesmosis so this is the entire ring if there is a single break it is a stable ring or if, and if there is a double break there is a, it's an unstable ring and if there is a break and shift it makes it an unstable and a subluxed ankle or a dislocated ankle so we need to make this unstable ankle into a stable ankle for better understanding or better functional outcomes so ankle fractures generally referred to as malleolar fractures they are intraarticular bi and tri malleolar fractures they should be distinguished from pylon fractures which are high energy uh, fractures usually caused by impaction of the talus like the plafon getting crushed by the talus so we all have studied and come up uh, or grown up on the laghans laghansons classification that is the supination adduction supination external rotation pronation external rotation and pronation abduction uh, this is an old classification not validated and especially by the un all there are newer things that are coming up but this classification accurately predicted the ligamentous injuries in almost 94% of cases hence this is a useful classification to keep it in your mind to predict or, or to uh, preempt what ligament injuries may have come through so terminologies used in log hansen are supination pronation and this is what it is so initial foot position whether it is supinated or pronated puts one side of the ankle under tension and rotation of the talus that's that in the transverse plane whether it is adduction or abduction or external rotation to the axis of the tibia makes the entire classification go through so in supination the force starts laterally and in pronation the force starts medially so in supination adduction the force starts laterally goes in this direction you have a infra syndesmotic fibula you have a vertical medial malleolus in supination external rotation again it starts laterally on the anterior surface of chaput tubercle it rotates externally so you have a trans uh, transsyndesmotic fibula fracture posterior malleolus and you may have a medial malleolus or a deltoid complex so it's a rotation along with supination in pronation abduction it starts medially goes on to the syndesmotic parts and you may have a comminuted fibula and in pronation external rotation again it starts medially goes on the syndesmotic part and has a supra syndesmotic fibula so how to simplify it if it's a vertical medial malleolus it's supination adduction injury if it's a horizontal you can have the remaining three that supination external rotation pronation abduction and pronation external rotation so again to simplify it further look at the fibula in supination external rotation you have a oblique transsyndesmotic fracture in pronation external rotation you have a supra syndesmotic fibula and pronation abduction you have a transsyndesmotic comminuted fibula fracture that's how you make it now which ones you need to operate which ones you need to non operate or can be treated conservatively are patients who have significant comorbidities and stable fractures like isolated minimally displaced lateral malleolus without any medial injury so that's a supination external rotation 2 injury so these ones but all for indications you need all displaced fractures and unstable fractures need fixation so my indication for surgery number 1 are vertical shears of medial malleolus which has marginal impaction as we see in this x ray so you need to disimpact restore so this is a supination adduction injury you to disimpact restore the articular surface you need to bone graft it and you may have to put an anti glide plate as it is seen in the x ray similarly in a supination external rotation 3 injury where you see a double shadow that's a postero medial fragment of distal tibia you need an postero medial approach and plate it number 2 for posterior malleolus a babul cursor has already uh, like dealt it in detail it's a supination external rotation 3 injury again uh, there is a haraguchi and there is a masons classification for it and depending on the classification you need to address the things this is how it goes in a rotational pylon type 2 mason and it goes on to fix the posterior marrow so there is it, this algorithm also tell us which approach to take depending on the ct scan so you can either put a screw anti grade or retrograde but as sir preferred and we all preferred from posterior to anterior it can happen this way 
or you can put a plate so fix the posterior malleolus because trimalleolar fractures have worse outcomes than bimalleolar fracture and the subluxation of talus has to be reduced so you need to fix the posterior malleolus it's also important while fixing the posterior malleolus that if there are any intercalated fragments or joint impaction you need to you need to restore them back and get the articular congruency back indication number 3 in the ankle is syndesmosis syndesmotic injuries are seen in supination external rotation 3 pronation external rotation 3 and pronation abduction injuries all the three of them get it so any unstable syndesmosis there is equivocal instability or at risk injury pattern and how do you identify it by medial clear space of more than 4 mm or a tibiofibular clear space of more than 5 mm in an ap view is an radiologic indicator that there might be a syndesmotic instability intraoperatively you can do the hook test or excessive mobility of the fibula you can do it in the ap plane or you can distract it laterally in both the planes you can do this and talar shift on external rotation stress it's important that we reduce it directly under vision and make sure that you also perform the intraoperative hook test and you reduce them now whether to pass three quarters is single screw four quarters is single screw two screws two screws four quarters is a matter of debate and it's a never ending debate important thing to keep it in mind is the fibula is placed 25 to 30 degrees posterior to the tibia and the direction of the screw has to be directed anteriorly from posterolateral to anteromedial at 25 to 30 degrees so for fibula fractures it can be seen in all the four types and we need to get anatomic reduction of fibula is very important because to maintain length at the ankle mortis longitudinal and rotational malrotations of fibula are more difficult to det detect and in certain conditions like in osteoporotic bone like in diabetics and all you can also do the pro tibia fixation where all screws are passed from the fibula into the tibia coming last but one most controversial topic is deltoid repair or indication for surgery is deltoid it deltoid injuries are seen in supination external rotation pronation external rotation and pronation abduction injuries and routine medial repair is not needed and we need to explore the medial side if reduction is not anatomical so if you consider the stability or the ring concept of stability any unstable fractures in pronation external rotation and pronation abduction we need to fix the deltoid or repair the deltoid in a supination external rotation 2 where the injury has not come up to the medial set it can be treated non surgically and in supination external rotation 4 where the medial set is unstable we need to repair it so how does one assess the stability it can be done by stress x rays or weight bearing x rays so stress x rays are done in this way uh, on the edge of the table where the patient is turned laterally you allow the foot to drop down and you take an x ray in an ap plane and this is how it's seen that's a gravity stress x ray at around 7 to 10 days and that's an indicator of deltoid competence or incompetence same x ray if you do it in a standing weight bearing x ray so this same so one of the papers in 2017 had mentioned that gravity stress x ray actually uh, over predicts the deltoid injury for surgery where they said that the most important component of deltoid that is the posterior tibio tibiotalar ligament that is the deep portion is lax when the foot is plantar flexed and gets taut when it is plantigrade so when you are doing a gravity stress x ray when the foot is plantar flexed it opens the medial side and gives us a false impression of being a medial instability and hence they believe or they said that more important is the weight bearing x ray but getting a weight bearing x ray in a fracture situation becomes little difficult so it's a very uh, clin a very clinical judgment that we have to take as surgeons in which one to go in and which one to not go in and each individual case is different so in so they further classified supination external four into stable and unstable injuries depending on the pttl injury and advocated only deltoid repair in an only in an unstable 4b scr cases so take home from ankle fractures is to assess and take care of soft tissues understand the mechanism of injury 
which will facilitate you to uh, to reduce all the fractures log hansen classification is important understand the ring stability where medial and lateral columns are intercalary and their intercalary ligaments are important you always achieve anatomic reduction for bones and be aware for potential for sin dismos and deltoid injury identify and treat them appropriately thank you thank you sorry i can't hear you the person is talking hello yeah i can but it's a uh, it's a very blurred voice i can take the questions on the chat box hello can you hear me yeah i can tell me abhishek yeah so any questions for dr abhishek kini dr navin thakkar sir do you have any question on this previous fine so we move uh, that was a wonderful talk a simple and a lucid talk thank you then dr abhishek kini we move over to our next talk which is on trimalleolar fractures around the ankle and may i call upon dr g santosh ram to deliver this talk over to you dr g santosh sir am i audible sir yeah you are audible however we can't yet see your screen sir actually uh... recording in progress yeah sir. yeah sir am i sir am i sir hello sir dr santosh ram yes 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 i am yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the one gentle request for you sir. don't have multiple devices yes sir i have just logged off i suddenly my laptop gave problem so i logged in in my mobile phone okay no oh, issue yeah. now no it's issue. Uh, now it's on sir i am just sharing my screen mm. so your talk is going to be on the trimalleolar fracture around the ankle which is popularly known as the cotton's fracture it's a yes, challenging sir. Yes, injury sir. to treat yes sir yes we can see your screen screen so, so you are now audible as well as visible visible so good evening Please everyone tell. yes good evening everyone uh, at this outset i would like to thank the all the organizers for this opportunity and special thanks to dr Uday Kumar sir and Sivanand sir, they both have been teachers, and Shushil sir has been teacher at various conferences as well. So straight away going into this, now a small disclaimer. So actually Shushil sir has extensively dealt about posterior malleolus, and now uh, in my preceding speaker sir has covered ankle fractures in total. So most probably this would be a repetition of that. So I've tried to deal as practical as possible. So this trimalleolar fractures. as we all know they are the most commonest intra articular fractures for a weight bearing joint that is why we encounter them commonly 
and it contains a complex array of both bony and ligamentous injuries. They are not just limited to the fractures. And the simpler fractures like isolated malleolar fractures, lateral malleolar fractures, or medial fractures are more common than are bimalleolar than are trimalleolar fractures. Doctor so Santosh Ram, sorry to interrupt you. Sir, sir. May I make a gentle request for you? Can you put on your PPT mode for the presentation so we can see it in the full screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, sure. That's good. Sir. Yeah, please carry forward and sorry for the interruption. Uh, sir. Okay, sir. So, and why are we so importantly discussing about this is the single most common cause for an arthritic ankle was if it had an initial traumatic event. Most commonly, it is our fractures rather than ligamentous injuries. So now the proper management of these fractures would need us to understand the fracture mechanism and how, what amount of bony and ligamentous injuries have happened due to that mechanism. Suppose say like, sir has already explained, suppose say it's an external rotation force applied to a pronated foot. You can have complete disruption of all the osteoligamentous structures and the end result could be a fractured dislocation as well. So these are a severe kind of injuries as far as ankle fractures are concerned. And when do we get uh, bad results? Whenever you reduce it improperly or even after reduction, you do an improper fixation or the initial injury could itself have caused a cartilage damage and comorbidities like our diabetes or neuropathy or vascular diseases or a vascular insult at the time of injury or uh, osteoporosis. All these also could result in poor results. So now we have primarily two modes of treatment. One is, may not be for trimalleolar, but a conservative or a surgery. So we need to give good results, irrespective of the treatment modality we choose. That is what an aim of treating any fracture is. So how do we reproduce them? For conservative, it is very simple. Get the indication right. Trimalleolar is not an indication for conservative fracture. So we are not going to deal with that. So when do we reproduce good results in a surgery? So the surgery is indicated for unstable fractures. That is even primal error fractures also. We treat them surgically because they are unstable fractures. So like sir has already explained. So when do we label a fracture as unstable? When it is broken at a single place, a single osteoligamentous structure or at multiple places. So this I've kept a three piece because I'm dealing about a primal error fracture. So this is highly unstable fracture whether it be in a young individual or an elderly individual or whatever it is. And sometimes most often these are overlooked. See here we can see a comminuted fibular fracture, a posterior malleus, and we can see a talar shift with an opening of medial space. Here medially we may not have a bony injury, we could still have a ligamentous injury. These are all primalular ankle fractures. So how is this ankle rendered stable? Is this because of the anatomy? The ring of stability already been explained. So it includes the congruent articular surfaces of tibia, talus, the various ligaments, syndesmosis, and of course, the plane of movements. So this is the anatomy has already been discussed. A, a note on syndesmosis. So as we all know, primarily has three components, the anterior tibiofibular, the posterior tibiofibular, and the interosseous ligament. So it is a very key structure for the stability of the ankle and if we fail to restore the syndesmosis the resultant instability is prone to give poor result no matter how well you have fixed the other structures so this deltoid and uh, lateral collateral ligaments have already been dealt and this i want to just tell you why this is important why restoring all this is important so we just think it as a simple hinge joint that only dorsiflexion or plantar flexion is going to affect our movements and the biomechanics, but we need to remember. So whenever these movements happen, there is a consequent inversion and reversion happening at the subtalar joints. And there is a adduction and abduction also. So whenever you are, it is pronated, usually it is going into uh, abduction. And whenever it is supinated, it is going into adduction. There is an inversion and reversion. That's why these subtalar and the other joints are called as the lower ankle joint sometimes and on a fixed ankle joint there could be an external and internal rotation of the tibia as well so those are our sagittal plane movements inversion aversion your frontal plane movements abduction adduction are horizontal or transverse place transverse plane movements so this is what i was talking about this is the 
coronal plane of rotation it is between the malleoli and the long axis of tibia that is to your right and the transverse place is where the midline of foot intersects with the long axis of tibia this is the various range of motions where we have so this anatomy has already been dealt so our talus our syndesmosis the articulating surfaces of tibia fibula along with the talus and the lateral and medial ligament complexes now a note on the shape of the talus so all the studies which have uh, which are cornered around deciding the stability of an ankle depending upon the ligamentous and osteo ligamentous integrity so most of them have been on the cadavers as well or lab where they section various ligament and subject the ankle to pressure and they see how much unstable it is most of them are reproducible yet sometimes as we all see all the other speakers are even more experienced than me the clinical results need not necessarily correlate with whatever we get in the lab most of the ligaments sometimes we don't address still those patients do very very well almost with a normal foot and ankle scores going back to their normal lifestyle so one particular reason for that not every time but is the interesting shape of the talus so it is broader anteriorly and narrow posteriorly just like the frustum so the to our right is the frustum frustum is nothing but if you take out the apex of either a cone or a pyramid the resultant structure is known as the frustum so why why is it important because it is little stable in dorsiflexion the talus gets locked in and it's little stable in dorsiflexion where most of our activities involve weight whenever we are weight bearing involves dorsiflexion so hence even minor ligamentous injuries and all even if not addressed they do well because of this congruent anatomy of the tibias and talus so our goal in treating this is ultimately this you need to get the talus inside once your talus is kept inside whatever prevent uh, is causing it to go outside we need to stabilize them so uh, that could be either a fracture or a ligamentous injury never forget the syndesmosis so for example the very case which i have initially put we can see there is a lateral shift of the talus so there is a fibular fracture and a high extending posterior malleolus fracture in fact this was actually a, i forgot to load the ct extending even medially as well so i had to extend really medially but i'll show and this whenever we so depending on this to understand to guide us to the treatment of angle fractures various classifications have come up those also have been dealt already this was the initial almost simpler classification it is our dennis weber depends on the fibular fracture with the level of syndesmosis of course it was too simple but that has formed a basis for our evo classification where a b c are depending upon the infra syndesmotic trans syndesmotic and supra syndesmotic and then they have added isolated lateral malleolus with a medial injury and with a posterior injury so com coming to how this trimalleolar fractures happen already been explained so this is a supination external rotation injury we can see in the sequence in which these are these all this uh, injuries happen so initially there will be a anterior in an external rotation injury there will be an anterior syndesmosis injury then a lateral malleolus posterior and then medial in a supination adduction there will be a tension failure on the lateral side then you will be a vertical fracture of the medial malleolus these are important because sometimes there can be a medial impaction in the articular surface and this should not be missed so whenever you get a uh, vertical pattern of the medial malleolus always prudent to get a ct scan if possible so that you don't miss this medial impaction this again a pronator pronated and external rotation what happens in pronation whenever the ankle is pronated the talus internally rotates there is a tension on the anterior tibio fibular ligament and the distal anterior tibio tibial surfaces the syndesmosis almost always inevitably is injured in pronation injuries and the level of fibular fracture also since this continues in external rotation is usually supra syndesmotic so a word on this is sometimes you can have an isolated medial malleolus injuries in pronation whenever you have an isolated medial malleolus or a posterior malleolus injuries in pronation let us not forget you have to palpate for the entire length of fibula because the force would have transmitted along the interosseous membrane you can have a high level fibular fractures like our masinovis fracture you can have fibular fractures up to the head and neck of the fibula now how do we decide how to fix these fractures one it depends on the fracture pattern and next 
after fixing it, we need to check the talus, whether it is inside the dome or not. And after all this, we have to check for the stability. So either by stress test, cinder, especially for the cinder stenosis, it will be dealt in the next. So our overview, what I'm telling is whenever you finish fixation, and if you think the tal talus is inside the mortise, now check for the stability of the fixation by putting the joint either to stress, or we can do this hook test or with a clamp test for the stability of cinder stenosis. If you didn't get it right, never hesitate to revise your fixation. Because getting a CT scan to assess a syndesmosis is a post-operative phenomenon and under our logistics, it is not always possible to get a post-op CT and then revise the fixation. But whenever we can do, definitely it's a good option, but better to do the all the verification per operative itself. Now, lateral malleolus, so we have various options. You can fix it with a plate or an intramedullary devices like rust nails or a thicker K wires or a TBW when they are small avulsion fractures, especially in pronation injuries. So usually when we get long oblique or spiral fractures, the best is a lag screw and a neutralization plate. So medial malleolus. So we have various options. In this case, we have fixed with the TC screws. So we need to fix it in an orthogonal plane. We need not cross the reach the other cortex. Just we get good purchase, that is enough. So other, but being perpendicular to the direction of fracture line is important. We do an open reduction, see for any loose fragments and anteriorly we verify the reduction as well and fix it with CC screws. Or another good option is you do a TBW. So better than this, actually, if you put a screw and around the screw, we do a circular wiring, that is good. And even for fibula also, yeah, this is one uh, fixation. You can put an intramedullary CC screw if a fracture pattern permits, but that is a little bit technically complex. Sometimes we may breach the cortices. So better not to, but yeah, that can be tried. You can do a TBW, a CC screws, or whenever you have a vertical pattern, then we need to put a transfer screws and maybe support it with an anti glide plate. So what about the posterior malleolus? Shushit sir has already dealt with it in detail. So yes, the various options are. So I just put up this X-ray to show that this can be dealt with even percutaneous screw fixation as well. So these screws have put posterior to anteriorly. I have not opened it. Just put the patient in a floppy lateral so that I can get a good hold of the reduction in a percutaneous manner. So I have done a percutaneous reduction, fixed it, and for the fibula, put a uh, lag screw and a neutralization plate. So when do I do a CT scan for this? Whenever there is a vertical medial malleolus fracture, when there is a posterior malleolus fracture, or atypical fracture patterns, that is, if it doesn't fit into the mechanism of injury we anticipate, or especially in osteoporotic or diabetic patients, if the fracture configurations are extremely comminuted or low level or small fragments, all those cases, a CT will help you to plan fixation and sometimes maybe even tell you whether this could be primarily salvaged with the fixation or other procedures like fusion or something has to be attempted in view of the unreconstructable fracture configurations. So this is one a case which I've already shown. And this is another case. It's a pronation injury where there was a transverse fracture of the medial malleolus and a fracture of the suprasyndesmotic fracture of the fibula. That fibular fracture, I fixed it with a plate. This medial malleolus, I fixed it with a screw. The posteriorly, I could not put another screw. There is this combination which I think you can appreciate on the AP X-ray. So I thought I leave it with a screw. And for the syndesmosis, I put a single transverse screw from fibula to tibia. So ultimately, while treating this trimalar fractures, is assess what all needs to be fixed, fix them, and see that the and, and uh, get your talus inside and see that it stays so. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Santosh Ram, for your wonderful talk. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Thank you for a wonderful talk. We are joined in by a noted foot and ankle surgeon, Dr. Pradeep Munoth from Mumbai. Dr. Munoth, do you have any questions? 
Uh, no, I think it was quite an extensive and a nice bio biomechanical um, presentation by Dr. Santosh. Uh, really good, eye opening. Very good. Uh, sir, uh, I myself have a question. Can I ask it now or can I do it later in the question? Yeah, please ask it now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's my question is to the house. Sir, whenever we are dealing with very high uh, supracyndesmotic fibular fractures, uh, is there an option that we can just fix a syndesmosis from a transfibular screw and leave the fibular fractures? Dr. Pradeep Munat, sir, can you take this question? Yeah, sure. Means as long as as long as we know or we can we know the fact that the fibula length is achieved, fibula rotation is achieved. Uh, I think you can get away without fixing the type C of very high uh, fibula fracture, and you can just fix the syndesmosis. The only reason people tend to fix the fra fibula fracture because once you know you get an anatomical reduction of the fracture you know that you will get your length and you will get your rotation. But there is no reason why you can just get get away without uh, fixing the fracture and just fix the syndesmosis. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, you are asking about Masanova? Uh, not just You are masanova. asking about Masanova only? Yes, sir. Yes. Santosh, yes, your sir, yes, question sir. was for Masanova fracture, very high fracture, right? Uh, yes, sir. It I could mean, be anything. It, 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 could, it, be it could be anything, sir. I am, I, am I am essentially asking about the kind of fracture which I have shown in my presentation, with, uh, almost uh, just below the mid diaphysis level. So I I fixed it, like sir said. I wanted. I to I, I think uh, how much interosseous membrane injury is there, sir, yes, sir. Instability. How much instability that you have to decide on the table? I think, Doctor yes, Manut. So again, so. As, as, as I said, so what do you mean by instability? Instability again is of the syndesmosis Sender. and the interosseous membrane, Sender. correct? Yes. yes Even if right. you have an interosseous injury, that will indirectly affect the syndesmosis. So if you have, if you fix your syndesmosis properly, and especially with what Dr. Santosh is mentioning, if you have significant instability, you would not just put one screw. You will probably put either two screws or a, or a recon plate and two screws, which would make your whole construct stable. So I think ah, yes. that yeah. that is that is what if you feel it is a stable even after the fixation of uh, syndesmotic, many times people like to taste and once they taste and they feel that it is still unstable. In that situation, many times syndesmotic reduction is not perfect, uh, which is not be easily judged on the table, even with the CM pictures. Yeah. So that so that's that's exactly the point which I made. A lot of people try to fix the fracture because you know you can get a fantastic anatomical reduction, which will then gives you a, a, a anatomical reduction of the syndesmosis. So that's right. why you do it. Yes, Santosh, sir. Santosh, sir. Santosh, I have a question for you and the house. Can I ask uh, Dr. Kale? Yeah, yeah, sir. Please, please go ahead. So, how often people who fix the posterior malleolus? Okay, and a fibula fracture, you find that the syndesmosis is still unstable. And especially this is from the biomechanical point of view as well. And I think Dr. Santosh may be able to answer. How yes, often yes. you find that after fixing the posterior malleolus, you fix the fibula and you still find yes. that the syndesmosis is unstable. One is the incidence and the second question, why does it happen? Uh, yes, sir. So I, I, I think... Uh... Uh, they, they, definitely there have been uh, scenarios where I found it to be unstable, sir. It's not like I fixed the posterior malice and I always got got away with it. Uh, so, um, so incidents, maybe I not maybe I may not be able to cite exactly, but yeah. But I think why does it happen? One is maybe if you're not uh, uh, getting the, uh, even the anteriorly also it is disappeared, not just posteriorly. Then fixing the posterior malleus alone might not confer a stability because the interosseous anterior also to be addressed. Maybe tibia maybe had to be put put back properly. So that is the only explanation I could think of. Maybe house can uh, give us some more explanation. If if this I am talking, if I have fixed the posterior malleus perfectly and fibula has been fixed. Of course, of course. So we, we are talking of the perfect reduction in the real fibula. Yes, that is yeah. that is what I I think so. Okay. Anybody else, Dr. Babulkar, sir, have any opinion on this? 
probably dr uh, we have lost dr babulkar sir he is not okay. online can okay. we have a opinion from dr agashya sir on this sure. point dr agashya sir can you hear us hello no probably again we have lost him so uh, dr dr munod probably the after fixing the posterior malleolus still after that that uh, posterior ligament construct is not good even after that mm -hmm. then and then there will be a possibility of instability even after the posterior malleolus fixation sure i mean i don't there, know there may be there there may be anterior tibia fibular ligament injury also associated with yeah. that that's what i was just that yeah. may be the reason yeah yeah so again the point for all the audiences after you fix your posterior malleolus after you fix your say, your fibula still check for syndesmosis and if the syndesmosis still opens up or unstable fix the syndesmosis so one final question if i can ask you and this is regarding regarding the chapet fragment so did you ever encounter i have actually encountered uh, this anterior avulsion from the fibula not from the tibia yeah very common it, it is i just yeah. did one i think last week um where the with the um, ai tfl has come out from yeah, the fibula yeah, from the fibula maybe the wax um, taffy fragment i think yeah. that's what we yeah. call them yeah So how most of the time that is not an issue because when you are doing your fibula fixation, yes, usually yes, exactly. the fragment just sits there and you, yes, you yes, can just exactly. take it yeah. in your construct. Yeah. yeah, that's what I just wanted to ask you. Sir. Yeah. So we need not additionally address that. Yeah, no, I don't do it. it. Yeah, it fell back in place with the construct. It was stable. I didn't do anything further, but I had a doubt. Correct. <laughs> <Correct. laughs> I just wanted to clarify it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to unshare, uh, Santosh, uh, Doctor Santosh, sir, and then sir. I can share. Yeah, I have already answered. Okay. I don't Dr. know why. Doctor Doctor Manoj, can I ask you a question? How do you test instability after fixing the posterior malleolus? <laughs> Somebody so, was asking from the audience. Yeah. Okay. So I I after fixing the posterior malleolus and of course I'm fixing the fibula. Ah, uh, there are various ways. The best uh, what I do is the easiest. First, I just externally rotate the ankle and give a valgus stress. um if the fibula if your syndesmosis opens up you you can clearly see it so so initially what i do is a, a a small amount of stress if i am still doubtful that that it is not opening up then i take a uh, my bone holding forceps the small eo bone holding forceps hold the fibula and then pull it out that is the second test and the third is of course i put a hook small hook and i pull it out so i never rely on one test i always check Two or three tests. You, you you test by the hook or lateral medial stress or intra posterior stress also. So no, so you I hold the fibula with my bone holding forcep and both give lateral as well as AP. So you have to check in both the direction. Um, the usual instability is AP instability more than medial lateral instability. Very well yes. pointed out. It, yeah, it's a it is not lateral medial. It is posteriorly. It is going always. Correct. Correct. Right, and how do you fix it? Do you fix it temporarily with the K wire, and then you put your uh, syndesmotic screw? No, so I I do not apply. Are you are you are you, are you using a point? Are you using a pointed clamp? No, I do not use a pointed clamp because I assume, and I uh, if my posterior malleolus is fixed anatomically, my fibula is fixed anatomically. i do not use a clamp i just do a normal neutral not even dorsiflexion i keep it in plantar position of the ankle i i have and i believe that the fibula will sit in its insusura if you are using a pointed clamp then you have to be sure that your pointed clamps or the prongs has to be in the transmalleolar axis okay i'm sure right. somebody who is come who is covering syndesmosis will do that otherwise your clamp is actually your your main culprit yes. for mal reduction yes okay so that Perfect. that is one thing so i do not use it i i reduce everything anatomically and then just drill it okay so i know the fact that my insusura is normal anatomical and my drill is again 15 degree posterior to anterior parallel to the joint line how many centers use or ct on table to see the whether syndesmotic is reduced or not because the most of the outcome problem is the reduction problem exactly exactly sir 
So again, you need to make sure that your fibula. So if your fibula is got to lend anatomically, you can see the lateral part of the 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 flare of the fibula, the coin sign. All these are different different ways of checking. So there is not one single check. Multiple checks you have to do. And on okay. your lateral view, on your lateral view, your fibula is within two millimeters of the posterior plafond or the posterior tip of the distal tibia articular surface within two millimeters. That's the that's the check thing, and that is again shoot through lateral, not turning the le leg. Shoot through lateral, sir. Yes, cross table, real cross, cross table. table. Yes, lateral. yeah, yeah. True lateral. How many times? How many times do you require to open and see that whether my reduction is perfect or so, not? I do not. Again, because I'll tell you what. So you're doing a posterior lateral approach, right? And then how do you see your anterior? So you have to make a separate incision there. I have separate incision, separate incision. separate yes. incision you have to do. And now, now you have your your AITFL, your three bands are still there. Then would you elevate those ligaments to see your reduction? So I do not. I think by doing a significant, by if you're doing a posterior lateral approach, then you to do an anterior approach. You need to look at the visualize. I think we're doing over dissection. Your, your whatever the ligaments and the soft tissue which are attached at the syndes muscle, you have to denerve it first. You have to denude it first, and then you expect that to attach it again. And also, there are papers indicating that even with visual, direct, open syndes muscle, you still have a thirty percent risk of malreduction. Right. So, so how many centers? How many centers use OR? Uh, so I don't know. On so table, I, on I, table I CT, know. on table CT, yeah, OR. Oh. On so, table CT, I don't think so. We yeah. have it in India. Anybody has yeah. that? Right. So probably the OAM in India is available at AIMS, Fine. New Delhi, Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. Now all, all now all spine surgeons are investing on that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So and okay. these are yeah, these three centers have OAM, and uh, they do use it even Kokila Ben Hospital at Andheri West in Mumbai. They have come up with the OAM. Yes. I. So that was an interesting discussion. Many teaching points came up in that discussion. We have a separate talk on syndesmotic injuries, but yes, before yes. that talk, but before that talk, we have a talk on uh, talus fractures, tips and tricks to manage it by none other than Dr. Pradeep Munod, who is a noted foot and ankle specialist from Mumbai, and he also practices at Hyderabad, Surat, and Pune. Over to you, Dr. Munod, sir. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, sir. You, you are visible and audible. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kale, Dr. Ashish Padnavis, um, M O N I A, for giving me this opportunity. So we'll be talking on um, slightly away from ankle. I think we have had enough discussion on ankle fractures, so something different. So uh, Taylor fractures is not very common. So that's why the incidence is very low. It's less than 0.1 to 0.85, less than one percent of all fractures. But in foot fractures is around five to seven percent, and the second most common tarsal fracture. Mechanism of injury I won't bore you much, but there is usually a hyper dorsiflexion of the foot. The tailor neck abuts against the anterior edge of the tibia. That is what we are thinking about it. But biomechanical studies have shown that usually an axial force acts on the ankle and the leg, which eliminates the ankle motion, and then you have a dorsally directed force. Now, if that continues, there is a cantilever effect of the talus, and there is a fracture of the talus. Now, if the force stops, you will have an undisplaced fracture. But if the force still continues, then you have the posterior talocalcaneum and the interosseous ligament ruptures. You have a subluxation or dislocations of the foot on the talus, and if still the force continues, then you have a dislocation of the talus outside the ankle joint. Now everybody is aware of the Hawkins classification, which was done in 1970, three types, and of course the four type added by Canal and Kelly, and these are usually based on displacement. I think right from our PG days, everybody has been using, and I think one classification which has stood the test of time because of the good. Um, I think the classification is fantastic. Type one undisplaced fracture of the tailor neck, usually medial blood supply is assured. Second is the Displaced fracture of the tailor neck with subtalar dislocation or subluxation. The medial blood supply may be present. Sublux uh, displacement of the fracture, 
with dislocation or subluxation of the tailor body from both the ankle and the subtalar joint. And usually blood supplies are disrupted. The fourth type, which was added later, there is dislocation even at the talonavicular joint, which is this is the worst of the prognosis because usually it's 100% avian of the tailor neck. So my talk today is how do you manage it? So the patient has come through casualty or through your trauma center and patient is there. How do you sort this patient out? Of course, you want to make sure that you get a reduction of the dislocation immediate. Then you want to make sure that you get anatomic fracture reduction and a stable fixation. So what are the pearls which we're looking at? So any patient who comes with a high degree of trauma in the foot, there has to be high degree of suspicion. So usually Taylor fractures happen in high energy trauma, hyper dorsiflexion, 15 to 20% are open fractures and malleolar fractures are usually in 25% of these people. Here you can see there is something going on in that area, which is a circle here. Second point and the pearl is how do you get a view to see the whole tailor? And this is important, especially when you are doing intraoperatively, you're fixing the tailors. You do not want to struggle. I can't see the tailor neck. Do I know if the reduction is good enough or not? That is the canale view where the foot is in equinus, slightly pronated in 15 degrees and the X-ray beam is directed 15 degree kephalid from the vertical. You should be able to see the whole neck in profile and I'll show you better pictures later on. That's from the book. Make sure usually, and again, again I think ankle fracture, somebody said they had the list, but in, in tailor fractures, invariably every patient should have a CT scan because you want to make sure that you are really showing that it is an undisplaced fracture. Usually if you get a CT, you will see multiple loose bodies. You may see a combination, which will change your management. That's why you get a CT scan done for Taylor fractures. Treatment options, really, if it is undisplaced type one, you can do in cast immobilization, or you can do a percutaneous screw fixation and mobilize them early. Pearl number four, close reduction technique. How do you do that? A lot of times people call me up, juniors, fellows say, how do you reduc reduce this dislocation? You need adequate sedation. You need to flex the knee to relax the gastronemias. You need to plantar flex the, the foot to realign the head with the body. And then you need to toggle the, the whole foot and the calcaneum in varus ovalgus to appropriately to get the necessary correction. Now, one more thing in reduction technique is when you take this patient for theater for reduction, suppose you can't get it in a &E, you take the patient to theater, you have to be prepared to do an open reduction if your close reduction does not come. So yes, you may, if we may fits in the night, you need to be prepared. Well, number five, percutaneous fixation is really, really only for type ones and type twos where there is no combination and you know that you have got an accurate reduction. Pearl number six, usually for type two and type threes and fours, you have to have known all the surgical approaches, usually either one incision technique or a two incision techniques and the types of incision and the approaches depends on the personality of the fractures. So which are the approaches which we use for Taylor's fracture? Usually it's an anterolateral approach that is causing the least vascular damage to the talus. You have the anteromedial approach, which can have a chance of injury to the artery of the tarsal canal. Then you have the posterolateral approach, which is usually not used only for percutaneous screws. Posteromedial high incidence of a painful sequelae. Sometimes have to use it if you have a if you have a, a posteromedial combination. Hawkins type two and three, as I said, you depends on where the combination is. It's usually medial. And usually you need an anteromedial approach. I talk to you about how do you do an anteromedial approach? It's usually medial to the cabellus anterior and the anterior compartment. Incision is usually from um, more posterior for Taylor body fractures to facilitate the medial malleolar osteotomy. So usually it's from the medial malleolus or the tip of the medial malleolus going up to the up to the base of the first metatarsal. You can use the incision. Uh, anteromedial provides good view of the neck alignment and the medial combination and usually the combination is medial so it's a good incision to have a direct uh, look at the neck. If the reduction is difficult to assess or you do not know if you got an anatomical reduction then you need to use another incision usually it's an anterolateral approach. The anterolateral approach is right down from the syndesmosis right down into the foot at the base of the fourth metatarsal 
you open it up usually it's quite safe elevate the edb and you're directly into the uh, neck of the um, tailors so this is what it looks like so and you need to make sure there is enough skin bridge between the two incision seven millimeter is the cutoff point and uh, there's another incision the direct lateral incision from the tip of the fibula uh, going to the base of the fourth like the sinus tarsi you slightly elevate anteriorly mobilize the edb and you can see directly the contents of the, the tailor neck and the lateral part of the whole tailors that's your direct lateral and this is good for a lateral process fracture as well posterior lateral everybody knows about it not used here or except for if you want to pass posterior to anterior screws that's what it is used from the books people who do tailors fixation should be aware of a medial malleolar osteotomy usually it's it's from the chevron from the shoulder of the of the ankle joint going vertically you can do a vertical direct split or you can do a chevron before you do that you do need to make sure that you drill pre drill for a malleolar screw so later on once you put it back it's very easy to fix it a uh, posterior medial approach if you have a combination which here you can see on the ct scan a posterior type of combination you can do a posterior medial approach and you can use it to fix uh, those kind of fractures so hawkins type 3 and 4 usually require dual incision which you need to make sure that you get a good reduction and then a good fixation now another point here is uh, which i think now everybody knows the fact delay in stabilization does not affect the outcome in terms of avn so that's why do not operate these patients for fixation for fixation in the middle of the night you can you can wait for some time let the swelling settle get your instrumentations your implants in place and operate it appropriately now a lot of times what type of screw should be used you i always use a titanium screws um because you want to get an mri done later on at 6 months one year whenever to see if there is avn or not and titanium it does not interfere no difference between headless and standard cannulated screws that studies have proven direction of the screws yes posterior to anterior screw biomechanically is uh, uh more stronger but even anterior to posterior screws is fine as long as you understand how you put your screws and the screws if you're doing post um, superiorly does not open up on the plantar side that's fine so direction of the screws again usually the combination is on the medial side so the first screw if you're putting only screws then should be from the antero lateral to posterior medial so like this type of screw so this will give you a nice compression of the neck hold and get the length appropriately and then on the medial side if you have combination here you can see you can put a fully threaded screw so not a compression screw but a holding type of screw or you could use a small plate as well so understand where the combination is and don't compress on that side because the last thing you want is a shortened medial fragment or a medial part of the neck which does give rise to a pes cable varus which is very very difficult to correct pearl number 10 plates you can use small 2 2.4 mm plates on the side of the combination and uh, that does not give you compression but holds everything nice in place hawking sign it is a good sign always make sure your patients you start x ray x rays or radiograph them every 6 weeks or 12 weeks and if you see a, a subchondral resorption then that means the vascularity is there so that's your hawking sign positive but if it is negative don't be disheartened you can wait and watch results of open reduction and internal fixation is good but there is always a risk of avn especially if there is comminution fracture pattern and open fracture as i already mentioned there is no correlation between surgery delay and avn if there is avn you need to wait and watch uh, protect them you can wait by then in a walker boot but if there is a collapse again you do not need to go immediately but later on you may require a fusion so let's start with the case so this is a case of a tailor's fracture 21 year old girl twisting injury to the ankle unable to walk um she came with this kind of a fracture and here you can clearly see there is something happening here is a double shadow on the tailor neck and the body on the ct scan you can clearly see i'll just pause that you can clearly see the fracture is starting in the neck and then going into the body so it is a neck and a body kind of a fracture there that's a very unusual type of a fracture here you can see here right just proximal to the neck and then going into the body 
So understand, go through the CT scan both in the um, in the sections as well as the 3D anatomy and then plan it appropriately. So planning was done. So proper views on the table, proper approach, accurate reduction and stable fixation. So how do you get the views? Canal and Kelly view to visualize the neck of the talus. That's how you get it. Now you can see how that's been there. So plantar flex pronated 15 degree oblique and this is the same patient's view. You can see this is the fracture line and you can see the whole neck in profile. So once that's done, so make sure before you start, you do that. Plan was to use a dual approach for better visualization. So anterolateral approach was used first, opened it up and we could see the whole fracture properly. We could see both the medial side and the lateral side of the neck and the body. What a good reduction and initially then fixed it with the headless screws initially put with K-wires and here again you can see how nicely you can see the whole neck. I know that I've got anatomical reduction and a transverse wire as well. So it was used. This was a headless screw and one more screw as well. Both were headless screws, titanium. And I was happy with the reduction, happy with the stability as well. So this is six months follow-up. She was fractured as healed with no evidence of avian, could not see anything. What an MRI done as well. The talus looks quite nice. Fracture was healed as well. We got a section of CTs as well on that. No evidence of AVN. And then there is a video of this girl. No problem. She got a good recovery. So this is another case. A young chap, again, I think he's a dentist by profession, had an injury to the uh, foot with this bat and he had a small um, wound on the medial side. So the primary surgeon treated him with an X-fix like this and kept him for six weeks saying, karenge, karenge, kab to surgery karenge, ek bar pura ho jata hai. At six weeks, he came to me with this kind of X-ray. You can see the talus is still the sublux out of the uh, subtalar joint. The neck is also displaced. This was the wound which had already healed in two weeks time. And he had put in an external fixer and kept it for six weeks. So the this is a CT scan. You can see here the talus is out of the subtalar joint. Neck is uh, the fracture is displaced at six weeks time. So plan was to do a dual incision. I did keep the shan spin just in case on the mm -hmm. table if I had to distract and use that on table. So that is an anterolateral approach, anteromedial approach. I did a straight away started with a medial malleolar osteotomy. That's how we planned it opened it up and reduced both on the medial side and the, on the lateral side reductions. That's the reduction which I can see here. I've got a good reduction and even the subtalar joint has been reduced. That's the neck and profile of the talus. And you can see here, I've still kept the shan spin on the calcaneum. Okay. And that's what I did. Finally, two screws, titanium screws, medial malleo osteotomy fixed. And you also had a avulsion on the medial articular surface of the talus that's also been fixed with the headless screw and the subtalar joint once reduced put a k wire that's your six months follow up i think it's got a good reduction thank you very much i would just last um, 24 hours for indian foot and ankle society's election so voting please uh, cast your vote thank you very much thank you dr pradeep punot for a wonderful talk so one query for you the first gain that you showed uh, was there a scope for a percutaneous fixation in that case? Because if you see the X-ray as well as the CT scan, the fracture line is there in both the plane, the coronal plane as well as the sagittal plane. So was there a role for a posterior anterior CC screw and a mediolateral Herbert screw, but percutaneous screw? So, but but again, if you see the CT scan, I, I can show you the the images again. That was not an that was not a perfect reduction. So there was I think more than two millimeter displacement. Now you could do a percutaneous reduction. Make sure you get a fantastic reduction, and then you could do a percutaneous. But a percutaneous, even if you see my wire is really in the plantar flex, I have plantar flex the whole foot and a medial lateral. I don't know how I would have done it with a percutaneous. I'm not. Fantastic. I like to see it open, but um, the CT I thought did not show evidence of displacement. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Agashi, sir, has a question. Agashi, sir. Yeah. Uh, Pradeep, yes, sir. Great talk. My question is, 
uh, when there is a dislocation of the body, pressing posteriorly, posterior structures, any tips and tricks for reducing that? Sir, you are, you are, you have more experience than me. me no, sir. no, 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 you are, you tell us. No, sir, so I, yeah, I, did mention, so I did mention that. So first thing, as I mentioned, if you're planning to reduce it, so initially you can try it in the a &E, but if these, these are high energy injuries, and if you can't get in any and you do take it to theater, be prepared. I think be prepared to open it up as well. Okay. So that is a rule number one. Um, so rule number two, give adequate sedation and a muscle relaxant to the patient. Bend the knee, bend the, and then pull on the calcaneum. You may need a shan spin to pull on the calcaneum and get that space. Open up that space and push from the back. But if you do not get it, you may need to open it up and put it or you could use percutaneous pins or K-wires into the body and push it back as well. So these are the various tips and tricks and I'm sure you have more, more uh, tips on that as well. Thank you. Sir, just a question, sir. Uh, this exactly is not on the fracture, but I've had two cases where the talus was out. Extruded talus. Extruded talus. So, what, how do we go about it? I, I'll, I'll tell you just what I did. Just correct me if I was wrong. So, one case, primarily we've debrided, done a fusion. Other case, we've put a cement spacer. After just going through literature, a few cases I've seen. So, I thought I'll try that. But, uh, uh, of course, it didn't come back. So, is it, which is the correct way to go? Uh, either primarily we can debride, put a X fix weight and do a fusion. Or can we try a spacer and later plan for a fusion? So, the, so you had the tailors with you? Once, yes. Second time, no. So, second time, no. So, there is no question only about that. So, the first time, now there are various case reports. And I think I remember around four or five years back, Dr. Mandi Dilo, sir, had sent a, 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 a form across all the societies to get all the extruded tailors cases together to have a larger series and experience from all the relevant surgeons. And I think Agashi sir also has experience in this and I've heard him talk as well on this many times. But looking at the literature, my point is you can take the tailors. Now this tailors is AVA, but I still think you can use this tailors. You can put it in sterilium. You can put it in betadine. There have been cases people have autoclaved it. Okay. And, and then put it back. Now the reason why you do all this, so it acts as a spacer. Okay, you know that this is going to be avian, but it acts as a bone graft and you maintain the length. Let everything heal. The only thing which you do not want is infection. This everything can be sorted out later. I don't know. I don't think so. You should primarily also do a fusion. I would not do a fusion. Let's wait and watch. It will go into avian later on when all the soft tissue heals up. You can always use this as a bone graft to do a TTC fusion, ankle fusion or whatever you want. And primarily, I think what you can do is one more thing. Sorry to add. You can just put a screw from the calcaneum into the subtalar, into through the subtalar into the talus. It is shown, not in this, but in Shaku and other cases and avian as well, that, that when you do this, you get a blood supply from the calcaneum into the talus. So, Agashi sir may have anything more to add, sir. I agree with you. I mean, I would rather tend to autoclave it rather than putting it in sterilium, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because one should be very careful about infection. If that thing gets infected, then you are finished. So I would rather autoclave it and put it back. Cheers. Uh, thank you for your valuable input. I have one question for Dr. Pradeep Munod. Sir, according to you, in modern day orthopedics, what is the what is or what are the indications for a pantella fusion on day one of the trauma? What kind of injuries would you go straight away for a fusion on day one? So in my book, so again, I think there are more and more trauma surgeon, experienced trauma surgeon in this, in this, I would say, uh, webinar than me. But I, I don't think so. That as of now, there is any indication for a pantella fusion. Yes, there may be an indication for a limited hind foot fusion. So, so we have to, people have to understand what is hind foot fusion, what is pantal. Telonavicular joint is a very, very, very important joint in the foot. I think that's one of the most important after an ankle joint. And you, we should try to preserve that joint 
as much as possible. Even if in future you have an arthritis or something, you can still preserve that. And also the other other thing now, while we are here, um, people doing pantalar fusion and ankle or hind foot fusion, I think people should be aware that in the next yearly in the next month onwards, we are going to get ankle replacements in India. So don't just do unnecessary fusions preserve the bone and preserve the joint as much as possible. Yes, you may have arthritis in six months, one year, but then you have a choice of an ankle replacement. So that's what I would say. So just one quick question on ankle replacement, though it's not a part of this webinar. So what is the 10 year survival rate of ankle, uh, primary ankle replacement surgery? So we have 10 year survivorship is approximately 80% now, which is wow. quite good, I think. Fine. That's an encouraging number. Yeah. Thank you for that valuable input. So uh, we move over to the next talk, which is by none other than Professor Sivananda, and who will be speaking on ankles and asthmatic injuries. Over to you, sir. You may start sharing your screen. Professor Sivananda, can you hear yes, us? Yes, sir. Are you able to hear welcome, me? Welcome. Yes, uh, we are able to, so you are audible as well as visible. Your screen is yes. well seen. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. First of all, I thank uh, West John Orthopedic Society for giving this opportunity and uh, Ortho TV for the giving this opportunity. And uh, IOA, which is conducting these programs, and I'm most thankful to them for the opportunity given today. So today's topic is uh, syndesmotic injury. This is called a high ankle spraying and this is a thunder box of controversies so from the diagnosis and investigations and reduction techniques and finally it is the fixation techniques also it is a big controversies and when to mobilize and when to immobilize and all these things are controversies in this particular thing there is a lot of debate going on with this uh, synesthetic injuries let us go with the what literature says and how we, we have followed so first of all, this uh, Naveen sir and uh, Pradeep Murad sir and all the speakers, almost 80% of my talk has been covered in the discussions. So it may be repetition, but we must listen again and definitely it will be useful, I think. So definition it is syndesmotic joint is not a true joint. It is a fibrous joint. By definition, it is it is connected with the ligaments. And epidemiology, when we go into that incidence, it is a 0.5% of ankle sprains without fractures, but it is most commonly it is associated with the ankle fractures. It just comes around 13% of the ankle fractures. So 13% is a good number, but we must identify what are the stable ones, what are the unstable ones. So before going to that, a sound knowledge of anatomy is very, very important. And the biomechanics of the ankle joint is also important, whether it is to be fixed or not to fix to decide that. So on weight bearing, normally the fibula migrates approximately two millimeters and translates laterally one millimeter and rotates externally it is two millimeters. This is the normal movement of the fibula. That means this is the joint between the lower portion of the fibula and the lower portion of the Tibia. That means this joint is a dynamic joint. This is the point I want to mention on this. So once we are seeing this ligaments, it is anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is the most important ligament lying on the anterior side, which is connecting between these two. And its percentage of giving stability is 30%. And another important ligament lying on the posterior side, it is posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, and it is the strongest ligament which is attached to the posterior malus and the posterior part of the posterior tubercle of the fibula. And its strength is, it is about 35%, but it is supported with the inferior posterior transverse ligament. Along with that, combined together, it comes around 50%. If you combine the strength of this anterior tibiofibular ligament and posterior tibiofibular ligament, these constitutes around 77% of the ankle stability will be maintained with these two ligaments. Of these two ligaments, posterior construct is much stronger than the anterior construct. This knowledge will give us some important things outwards. So another ligament that is connecting in between these two bones is the interosseous ligament, that is interosseous membrane that is extending from about onwards and the direction is from the, from the supramedial to infrolaterally that is directing 
and this is giving strength at around 10 to 15 percent of this uh, load that is shared with this and along with this the fibula also carried some amount of 10 to 15 percent of the body weight will be transmitted to the fibula that means it is a load bearing bone and that bearing bone that is directly connected in the inferior joint that is syndesmotic joint that loads will be transmitted to that particular area if the disorganized joint will lead to the post-traumatic arthritis that is our main goal it should be prevented and it it changes the dynamics of the ankle joint and most important always we are thinking about the connecting structures in the lateral part but always you should remember somebody is holding the talus on the medial side also which is much powerful than the lateral structures that is the deltoid ligament that is the one, it is having superficial deltoid ligament and a deep deltoid ligament. We must know that this superficial deltoid ligament is spanning the both ankle joint and subtalar joint. And the deep deltoid ligament is spanning the, it is only ankle joint. So if the deep deltoid ligament is disrupted along with the superficial things, then you will get the talar translation. If the superficial deltoid ligaments are ruptured, then you will get the only talar tilt, but there is no translation. So tilt and translation can change the biomechanics in the ankle and ultimately it can lead to the arthritis. This is the matter of debate whether these ligaments should be repaired or not. There are the uh, huge debate is going on, but once when to repair them, it is a debate now, then we will discuss that. Another important ligament structures that is connecting the fibula to the talus is the anterior talofibular ligament and posterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament. Of these three ligaments, calcaneofibular ligament, that is most important ligament and the posterior talofibular ligament is also most important ligaments. And anterior talofibular ligament injury, most commonly what we say the sprain. So what routinely? So why we say that syndesmotic uh, injuries are high sprain? High sprain means the ligaments above the joint line are torn. That's why it is called as high sprain ankle. The ligaments that are torn below is mostly it is the anterior talofibular ligaments commonly we see in the sprain ankle. That is the low ankle sprains. So which can be dealt with the conservative management, but high ankle sprains, it is not dealt with the conservative management, some of the things. And what are the forces that are responsible for this injury? It is mostly, it is because of the aversion, external rotation and forcible dorsiflexion. So aversion, external rotation and forcible dorsiflexion will produce the, the widening of the syndesmosis because anterior part of the talus is broader than the posterior part. Once it is going into the external rotation or aversion or into the forcible dorsiflexion, it suddenly separates the ankle joint. So once it is separated the ankle joint, then it may lead to the rupture of the superior ligaments. That too, those are anterior inferior tibiofibular or posterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments. You can see here it is pronation external rotation injury. This one is the pronation external rotation injury. Classically, it is seen. And here it is. Here also it is a pronation abduction injury. This is uh, it is very classically it is seen in this picture. These are all high velocity injuries. This is the point we must remember this, but supination external rotation injuries is some amount of a low velocity when compared with the pronation external rotation and pronation reduction injuries. But always we must remember supination external rotation injuries are the most common one in the ankle. So we must know in detail about this particular uh, thing. So how do you look into that uh, injuries? So once you see this, this is a pronation abduction injury, it is a medial malleus injury. There is a combination of the fibula and the cross wide separation of the syndesmosis and the talar is shifted in between these two bones. This is abduction injury. Once you see the rotation injuries, most of the times it is not comminuted and it is a oblique fractures. These will produce a simple translation towards that because uh, there is a complete tear of the medial collateral ligaments. The deltoid ligament is completely torn. And don't underestimate this uh, posterior malleus. Posterior malleus is connected with the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament along with the fibula. So, which is very, very strong construct. It is constituting 50% of the load is that is transmitted through this particular ligament. It is holding it. So, once it is 
not properly addressed, definitely it will lead to the syndesmotic problems. So never forget that. So this is the misnomy injury. This is, you can see the no bone injury in the ankle, but you can see the spiral fracture at the higher level. Always you remember, once there is a bony injury, the ligaments are attached to that particular bony part. And if once you reconstruct the bony part in a right anatomical area, then definitely your results will be good. Once it is in the no bony injury means, that means the complete the ankle ligaments are disrupted. This is much more danger than this uh, bony injuries. If you can reduce them perfectly, then definitely you will get good reduction. But these injuries may miss unnoticedly and these patients may go for a, a continuous uh, problems. So this one is the supination external rotation injury. It is just at the level of the syndesmotic injury. So these are the things uh, where uh, the mortis appears to be absolutely reduced and uh, there is no any displacements. But definitely you have to test this uh, supination external rotation injuries, which are very common for us. For the stability of these things, the syndesmosis must be tested. Why? Because once there is a medial ligaments are injured, medial myelitis is injured, or medial structures are damaged, definitely these the structures may produce instability and the syndesmotic instability may be seen in these particular cases. So how do you address them? So by clinical examination is the very important tool you must see in all these patients. A localized pain at the anterior talofibular, inferior talofibular ligament, that is point sign we will call it as, and tenderness just above the ankle joint on the anterolateral aspect, and pain extending from the joint to above. This is the most important that patient always says. The pain is extending from the joint and it radiates upwards. That is definitely, it is a very important clinical sign. And swelling over the medial aspect, uh, that indirectly says the medial structure is also lost. And swelling over the lateral malleolus, that says it is the fibular fractures are there. And once you do the dorsiflexion, definitely these patients will have a limited dorsiflexion in these patients. So once after fixation of all the malleolus and everything is there, then after one month or two months after weight bearing, if patient comes with this, all these particular symptoms, definitely you have missed the syndesmotic injury. Clinically, this will tell you, you have to investigate the particular patient. Then how do you investigate? How do you test them? Clinically, there are certain tests that will tell you this patient is having a syndesmotic injury. This is squeeze test and external rotation stress test and the fibular translation test. And there is a cotton test and a cross leg test and point test that is already I mentioned. A patient will point out with a single finger at the particular anterior inferior tibular fibular ligament areas. So let us see the some of the clinical tests, how we have to perform this. This is the squeeze test. You have to perform it from the above. And this is the external rotation test. Once you hold it and if you do the external rotation, if there is abnormal movement and patient will tell you pain over that particular anterior inferior tibial fibular area. And this is the fibula translation test. If you hold the ankle and you hold the fibula and you do the movement. And another test is most important is the cotton's test. You stabilize the leg and shift the talus towards the lateral side. If it is shifting, outwards, that means there is a talus is moving outwards. But be aware of that in these tests, always you should check for the legmentous laxity in these patients once you cross check it. Out of these tests, the external rotation stress test and the squeeze test are most significant. The rest of the tests are not that much significant. So that's why it is again debate in these particular issues. So then after clinical examination, definitely you will ask for uh, radiological investigations. So what are the x-rays you, you should ask? It is the AP view of the ankle and mortis view and the lateral view. These are the three views that are very important for the understanding of this syndesmotic injuries. But never forget to take the joint above and joint below. This rule of two always you must follow in the ankle injuries. And at the same time, Always you must feel the fibula from the distal to proximal in all the ankle injuries whenever you suspect it. This is the one of the important messages we must keep it in practice to identify the injuries. And some of the stress tests also it is useful to say that whether the syndesmosis is injured or not. That is external rotation stress test and there is a gravity test and there is a gravity test. 
So you ask the patient to lie and uh, keep the foot in the dorsiflexion. But uh, most of the times, these patients in acute injuries, they can't keep the foot in the dorsiflexion. That's why they keep in the plantar flexion. And the foot automatically, because of the gravity, it will go into the external rotation. As uh, Abhishek Kini already mentioned, that as the weight-bearing films are much, much useful, but we cannot provide weight-bearing films in acute injuries. So in a chronic injuries, definitely we can ask for uh, these things. But in this scenario, we have to ask for a gravity test is much useful in these patients. So what do you see in this gravity test? Once you do the gravity test, always check for the medial clear space on the medial side. This will tell you about the medial structure. So in your lateral side, you will know that there is a lateral malleolar fracture. This medial clear space, if it is increased, definitely this will tell you important thing. Then what are the things you have to see in those X-rays? The first thing is medial clear space. If it is there, definitely it is syndesmosis is ruptured. It is 4 mm, more than 4 mm it is there, it is ruptured. Then you can see the talus, talus is already translated laterally. So then another one is tibiofibular clear space. Here it is one centimeter above the ankle joint. Then you can measure it, the lat medial border of the fibula and the lateral border of the incisor of the tibia. If you measure it, if it is more than six millimeters or more than five millimeters, definitely it is an indicator of uh, this syndesmotic rupture. And another important thing is tibio fibular overlap. And just above the one centimeter, normally there is an overlap of 10 millimeters. Anything is less than six millimeters, definitely you will think of it as a problem with the tibio fibular overlap. And uh, always check for the Shenton's line. Shenton's line means it is the uniform articulation of the talus with the platform of the tibia. So this gives the a uniform articulation. This is akin to the Shenton's line in the dislocations where we see in the hip. And another important thing is, this is a Mercedes bench sign. These three will join together at the incisor. That is a Mercedes bench sign that will tell you. So the ankle mortis is perfectly reduced. And the last one is the dime sign that is in the inferior vertebra part of the fibula, you will see that there is a notch and that notch should match the talus and this will produce a circular part. So once it is not circular, that means that the talus is, the fibula is migrated upwards or it is externally rotated in the rotating situations also, you never get the dime sign positive. So all these signs are very, very useful to suspect the syndesmotic injuries, radiological examination. So these are the things, tibio fibular overlap, it is normal, more than six. If it is less than, it is definitely abnormal. And tibio fibular clear space, it is less than six, it is normal. If it is more than six, it is definitely abnormal. And uh, tibio medial clear space, if it is less than four, it is definitely normal. If it is more than four, it is abnormal. Of all these, the one thing is very, very important. It is tibio fibular clear space. It never changes in any posture. So that's why the tibio fibular clear space is the most important one we must remember in these cases. Both in AP and uh, ankle mortis view and any view, if you take it, then this space will be always maintained in a normal ankle. But all these references, please remember all these references, always compare with the same normal ankle on the opposite side. Then only all these references are useful. This is a matter of debate. All the ankles are not aligned in a normal way. And these will be changed in a different individuals and in the same patient for the both ankles. So the, the anatomy will change. So always compare with the normal side. Once uh, we diagnose that uh, this is the syndesmotic injury by clinical examination and uh, radiological examination, then you have to decide whether it is stable or unstable syndesmotic injury. So if the patient is able to bear weight after injury, that means that ankle is stable. If the patient can able to walk, that means that ankle is stable. It doesn't need any fixation. And local ecchymosis over medial or lateral side of the ankle, and there is no displacements and no abnormal motions. So definitely that ankle is normal. So unable to bear weight, high degree of violence and swelling local ecchymosis on the both ankles, obvious clinical displacements. Not commonly we see in the pronation axial rotation injury and uh, misnovy injury, and we will see the pronation abduction injuries. 
So abnormal motion of the talus in ankle that is clearly seen in the talar shift and the talar tilt. Definitely that will give you the clue. So in spite of this radiological assessment and uh, clinical assessment, uh, still uh, we are not sure whether it is definitely, it is 100% it is normal or not. So those things will be verified. The best investigations uh, or the MRI is the best investigation of choice. And the second one is we can go for the CT scan for the fractures associated with syndesmatic injuries. And the final, the ultimate master is the orthoscopy. So by doing orthoscopy, you can able to assess all the syndesmatic issues. I will come to the later on with that particular things. And the clinical and radiological findings decides the stability. This is the important thing. Depending on this stability, there is a treatment protocol and they graded this uh, syndesmotic injury as a grade one. In this, anterior inferior tibular fibular ligament is injured, but clinically there is mild pain is there and patient can have a normal radiographs. If the anterior inferior tibular fibular ligament plus interosseous membrane injury is also there, then uh, these patients also can present with the normal radiographs, but positive external rotation and squeeze tests, these are considered as grade two. And grade three, all the ligaments, both lateral, posterior, and medial structures, all the structures are damaged, then definitely there is a clear widening of the tibia and fibula at the syndesmotic level. Definitely it says clear test. All the clinical tests will be positive, radiological tests will be positive, and everything will come under. It is a definite one. So for the grade one and grade three, it is direct visible that for the grade one, there is no surgery. For the grade three, it is definite surgery. And grade two is the dilemma of uh, conflict, whether it is to be done or not. These are tests by the provocative tests. Once you do the provocative tests, uh, if these provocative tests are predictive and these patients are having a, a more uh, displacements and uh, all the uh, angles are increased, then definitely these patients need uh, a fixation to avoid post-traumatic arthritis in future. So once we see this, next part is reduction. So already the Pradeep already discussed this. In spite of all your efforts, it is 30% of this syndesmotic reduction, sir. It is not perfect. Not perfect. So how to avoid this uh, mal reductions in these patients? But unfortunately, Fortunately, even though there are mal reductions are there, patient uh, will complaining of uh, a normal activities, some of the people, and some of the people, they are not uh, normal. They cannot perform their normal works. And comparing normal ankle imaging is the mandatory. So do you think that if sometimes we think that this syndesmosis is not perfectly aligned, if you take the opposite ankle, that ankle looks exactly like this, that means always always you have to compare with the opposite ankle imaging it is a mandatory you must take prior surgery you must take the all the images of the opposite ankle once you plan for surgery then how to reduce this fracture that is the next dilemma so there are two methods one is clamp technique and another one is the manual technique so both has given equal results it is a randomized study has been done in this particular issue by the young Hawan. They concluded that whatever clamp you use it, whatever method you, manual method you use it, the reduction of the syndesmosis results are same. They are, once they have done study of the CT scan to assess the syndesmotic reduction, both are equal, both are equal. But the problem with the clamp, as Manut said, if the wrong application of the clamp, definitely that will lead to the mal reduction. It must go in the trajectory of the fibula and that perfect trajectory, you must pass this clamp. So this clamp, if you put it in the posterior set, definitely the fibula will translate posterior. If you keep it in the anterior set, then definitely it will translate anteriorly. But there are anatomical variations in the syndesmotic incisor of fibularis in the tibia. Sometimes there is a shallow anterior incisor of fibularis, then the fibula try to shift towards the anterior side and there is a deep uh, incisor of fibularis, this fibula definitely try to shift posteriorly. This anatomical variation is best identified with your CT scan. Sometimes when you are planning for surgery, it is best to take the CT scan prior to this. Then 
once you've done the surgery, then how to assess this syndesmotic reduction, whether you have done it right or not. So reduce the fibula first. All these fractures or all these syndesmotic injuries are because of uh, trauma. In this trauma, the medial structures, posterior structures, and the lateral structures, that is fibular fractures, posterior malleolar fractures, and the medial malleolus, and all these fractures must be fixed in a perfect anatomical mode. You must maintain the length, you must maintain the rotation, and you must maintain the perfect opposition in these areas. Once you've done it, most of the times, this syndesmotic fixation doesn't need in these patients. Any abnormal fixation of these things, this will affect the syndesmotic joint and indirectly it will lead to the syndesmotic problems. So how to assess this reduction? On table, so expose the distal tibiofibular joint. As Manoj said, most of the times we need not expose it. But in a older cases, definitely we need to expose the tibiofibular joint. We have to do the debridement in that particular area where you will find the osteophytes and all the issues are there then this is the area of what indication for exposure, open procedure for the syndesmosis reduction. And in preoperative fluoroscopy, there are certain guidelines and criteria to identify whether the syndesmosis is perfectly reduced or not. And in preoperative CT scan, as Naveen Tekar said, so he is asking about the OOM. So most of the hospitals, they won't have OOM and it is impossible to get that in a routine practice. But we must master the technique of intraoperative fluoroscopy. That is the most important. And intraoperative orthoscopy is also a luxury for us because uh, a trained personnel must be there. And that is done whether it is syndesmotic rupture is there or not. You must pass the 3 mm probe into the both the areas through and through from anterior to posterior completely. If it is passing easily from the anterior to posterior through the syndesmotic joint, that means that definitely there is a syndesmotic injury is there. That is the one important uh, orthoscopy. And advantage of orthoscopy is you can able to visualize other injuries and you can able to visualize the ligament structures directly. So that's why orthoscopy is the gold standard. The next to that, it comes to the orthoscopy is a dynamic also. So it is a syndesmos is a dynamic joint. So dynamic testing also can be done with the orthoscopic imaging. But MRI will give you equal results, but it is non-invasive procedure and it will give the, all the ligamentous ruptures in the anterior, posterior, and medial, and all the structures, what are happening, and what are interposing tissues also, it will easily visible with this MRI. So both the MRI and the orthoscopy are the gold standards, and the CT is best important in the malunited fractures and acute fractures, and intraoperative fluoroscopy, it is on-table decisions and preoperative evaluation by the fluoroscopy. Then how do you assess this uh, reduction? So all these injuries, the most important thing is the restoration of the fibular length and the fibular rotation. These are the two important things you must assess in these patients. A fibular length is assessed by the a dime sign. So you must assess the dime sign. And always this also compare with the normal joint. This point you always remember, I am stressing on this. Always compare with the normal joint. Then you assess the the dime sign. Dime sign definitely it will tell you whether the fibula is righted upwards or downwards or whatever it is. And uh, the Mercedes bench sign is also definitely that will tell you ankle mortis is uniformly reduced or not. The fibular height is uniformly maintaining the syndesmotic joint or not. That is another important thing. And laterally also you can able to assess the assess the fibula. This is Sagittal plane displacement of the fibula in the syndesmosis. In the AP view, you can able to see the coronal plane displacement of the fibula. You can able to assess it. But most of the times, you will see the displacement in the sagittal plane rather than the coronal plane. So most of the time, this is displaced posteriorly. So how do we assess this uh, reduction? This is assessed by the anteroposterior tibiofibular ratio. So that is the one you can able to see this. You can see this. So this is the scar of the epiphyseal scar, distal epiphyseal scar. You draw a line from the anterior part to the, in the middle part means, this is not the middle part. You draw a line from the anterior cortex of the fibula straight away. Where it is intersecting the anterior cortex, this epiphyseal scar, you make another point. From there, you extend the line. Then you measure the 
distances. This is A is from the anterior part to this where intersection of the epiphyseal scar, and here it is the posterior part to the intersection. So A is B. A by B is equal to this is this will give you the ratio. It is roughly it is come coming around 0.94. That means it is almost equal. Both the things are equal. And another important thing you can see this here is the the posterior border of the lateral malleolus is exactly at the articular surface area. Is exactly at the articular surface area. And if you see this, the anterior and posterior fibular issue is a posterior two thirds of the articular area of the tibia is occupied, and anterior one third is left over. This is how we can able to assess uh, this uh, fibula translation anterior or posterior. And another important thing, the width of the fibula also will give you indirect clue if you compare with the opposite side. If the fibula is externally rotated or internally rotated, the width of the fibula will be altered. So once the width of the fibula is altered when compared with the normal side, definitely that will give you indirect clue. It is a rotation, it is mal rotated. It is in an axial plane, it is rotated. So once you see here, here it is the, the fibula is posteriorly displaced. Here the fibula is anteriorly displaced, mal position, mal position. So by keeping all these things, you must check the reduction on table, on table with these issues. Once you reduced, you have to test it dynamic because this joint is a dynamic joint, you must check it. Once you check it, if the fibula is moving outwards, it is a translating. So then definitely this is the cotton test on table checking both the AP direction as well as both the medial lateral coronal plane and as well as sagittal plane, you must check it. If any movement it is going out as per the rules, so it is a tibial fibula space and all the things we have to check the radiological parameters, then you have to apply the syndesmotic screw to maintain the syndesmotic stability. So once uh, reduction is over in all these patients, then you have to check for fixation options. So once you try to do the fixation, once you reduce it, either manual method or this method, first provisionally, you have to fix the joint with a K wire, a strong K wire. Provisionally, you fix it. Then you can apply the plate, depending on the personality of the fracture, personality of the individual surgeon and the individual things. Then according to that, you have to stabilize this fracture stabilize the syndesmotic joint uh, either with a dynamic, uh, that is suture anchors in the uh, tight rope or with the combo that is tight rope with a uh, uh, screw or sometimes directly with the syndesmotic screw, whether you want to use a single screw or double screw, that depends on the level of the fracture. The more or higher the fracture, always you have to fix two screws. If the lower the fracture, definitely you can go with the single screw. That is the best one. Once you are orderly, when you are fixing it, always fix the lower screw first, then you go for the higher screw. Once you are fixing the high level syndesmotic um, fibular fractures. So in this, sometimes you can use the two screws. These are all depends on the how amount of instability is there that can be fixed with the whether it's two screws or one screw. These are all matter of debate. Even one screw fixation is good or one cortices, three cortices fixation is good, or sometimes it is a four cortices fixation you can use. Wherever you want to improve the stability, you have to use more screws and more cortices, you have to go for the purchase. This is a matter of debate again. In spite of all these fixations, most of this uh, a dynamic fixation or a static fixation, the plenty of studies has been shown that both the fixations will give you the equal results. Equal results. Here the consensus are whether it is hydro dynamic fixation, it needs a more cost. That is the most important thing. A simple screw is a is a less invest and less cost. That is a cost effective in these areas. So when to remove, when to apply, and these are all uh, once you want to dynamize the once you want to mobilize the patient, then automatically you have to remove the screw. But once you remove the screw, sometimes this syndesmotic problem will reappear. That's why most of the surgeons, they don't want to remove this. They will leave it. Even though the fracture of the syndesmotic screw is happened, nothing will happen most of the time. So after fracture, patient will be more satisfied than the, the screw in situ. So these are the studies has been shown that these are the results with this. So 
This is a once you apply the four cortices, once it is fractured, the removal of the screw will be very easy if you apply four cortices. If you apply three cortices, it is difficult to remove the screw. So you can leave the screw, nothing will happen in this. Only thing you have to assure the patient and before that you have to tell the patient. So after fixing this six weeks, a partial weight bearing, you should allow this patient. And phase one to reduce the pain and swelling, it is a ice application and cam boot and a physio you advise to reduce the swelling. And phase two, it is a non-weight bearing ankle movements to improve the movements. And phase three, you have to go with the weight bearing of the particular individual. Once you start weight bearing, but there is a rule always, it is the double the time of the ankle fracture fixation, always you should immobilize these patients. Always warn the patient that once, if the pain is persisting, please don't keep the total weight bearing in these patients. So this is the rehabilitation protocol. And finally, the message is, Identify the fracture pattern that will tell you what is the syndesmotic injury is there or not. And always compare with the normal ankle radio parameters, radiological parameters. This is the most important key. And the CT is must for old fractures with syndesmotic injuries to identify the uh, fracture pattern and in rotations and shortening of the fibula or malunion of the posterior malleus. And MRI is must for pure ligamentous injuries, which is costly and uh, give perfect reduction. If possible, even in old injuries, definitely you have to go for open reduction only. And the progenial stabilization is must. Otherwise, uh, directly you apply the plate and if you want to apply the screw, sometimes this may not give you the perfect uh, maintenance of the reduction. So once you get the reduction, you maintain it by the provisional fixation. Then fixation of choice depends on the personality of the fracture as well as it is the surgeon's choice in these cases. So management depends on high index of suspicion whether the patient is having syndesmotic injury and clinical radiological correlation and intraoperative anatomical assessment, reduction assessments and the stable fixation will give the best outcomes to avoid it is only the post-traumatic arthritis which is because of the changing in the biomechanics at the syndesmotic joint. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sivananda, for that wonderful talk. Uh, next, the next talk will be by Dr. Bhima Sagashetsa, and she is going to show us an interesting case. Dr. Sagashetsa, can you share your screen? Yes, please. I, does anyone have any questions on the previous talk? So just a small question, sir. Uh, Sir, uh, uh, yeah, doctor, sir. yeah, on the studies, it's okay. Sir, pra practically, have you ever tried any comparison between uh, our endo buttons with the uh, ropes and uh, screw fixations? Yes, sir. There is a study on the tight rope and the screw fixation and endo button. All the fixations are equally, equally giving good results. But the issue is, if you want to mobilize the patient very early, the tight rope will give you the a better advantage in these patients. So if you give a static fixation, you cannot mobilize the patient immediately. That is the price issue in these cases. Once you want to rehabilitate patient very early in these issues, you have to do the combo. So once you fix the a static fixation along with the dynamic fixation, you can remove the static fixation after six weeks. Still, that syndesmotic integrity will be maintained with the tight rope that can take care of the syndesmotic problem for the future things. So, studies has been proved that all the fixations are equally good. But depending on the things, uh, the personality of the fracture, the quality of the bone, and uh, depending on the coma bits, all these things will add you, the number of screws will increase. And the high level fractures, you have to use two screws. Just uh, these are the things only they are wearing, but fixation is same. Any fixation, it works well. Thank you. Thank you. So we move over to the last part of this webinar, which is an interesting case. Over to you, Dr. Agashi, sir. Thank you very much. At the outset, I sincerely thank uh, Dr. Shinde, uh, Dr. Shivananda, IOA uh, dignitaries, Dr. Kade for inviting me, and uh, all the viewers. Uh, this is just a simple bread and butter case. 
reasonably straightforward. This is a middle-aged person with diabetes. He presented with abscess over lateral aspect of ankle, as you can see here. There's an abscess over lateral uh, side of ankle. The medial malleolus seems to be in non-union. The lateral malleolus possibly yield, not possibly yield. Not too sure. So this, this is his history. Uh, he had a biomyelular fracture. Here you can see possibly syndesmotic injury. He was treated with a single screw and a lateral malleolus plate. At three months, he has a non-union of medial malleolus, lateral malleolus. The surgeon was not too sure. Uh, the syndesmosis also seems to be in distraction. So that was a time when he consulted another surgeon who took a CT scan. You can see the medial malleolus definitely in non-union. The lateral malleolus also is possibly in non-union. And the syndesmosis is open. Here you can see there's a small posterior malleolus stressing what all has already been discussed. At that time, the second surgeon took over and he put two, added one more screw on the medial malleolus and added two syndesmotic screws. Unfortunately, after three months, he developed infection and uh, when he presented to me, there was an abscess on the lateral aspect of elbow. And this is the area marked by the patient, which where the temperature, local temperature is high. So I just excised this. The plate was loose, so I took out the plate. You can see the large amount of bone had to be removed. And I have scraped through the, the loose or widened holes of syndesmotic screws. So at this stage, I would ask the panelist as to how should we go for further. You can see there is a medial malleolar non-union and there is a large defect in the lateral malleolus and the syndesmotic screws which were holding have been taken out. So, so can, may I can, know, uh, now, yeah, now how many days old this injury is since the last surgery? Three months. Three months after last surgery, six months after the first surgery. First surgery, the index surgery. And That's now... Yeah, and now the clinical parameters, is there any evidence of infection? At this, this is just immediate post-op or say about uh, eight days after surgery. And the wound appears quite clean, as you can see here. The yes. wound is very clean. Yes. There is no other evidence of infection. All CBC, CRP, etc. is normal. And here normal. you can see the wound is absolutely clean. Sir, but uh, a huge effect in lateral malleolus. Sir, uh, have you got the culture reports now? Or yes, he was MRSA. He was yes. methicillin resistant bugs and then he was treated with vancomycin. He was vancomycin. Right. Sir, has any antibiotic impregnated bits been added during the surgery? The last at surgery? This, at this stage, it was not added, but then after that, I did add. Fine. Fine. During the next surgery. Great. Yes. Fine. So, we have with us Professor Sivananda, sir. So, your opinion on this case and how we can take it further from here. Hello, probably we have lost him. Uh, we have with us Dr. Pradeep Punotsa, sir, your opinion on this? Uh, yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello, yeah. No, so I think as of now, I would just hold tight, let this, um, I think granulation, no, I think putting the antibiotic beads is a good thing. 
give him antibiotics whichever is appropriate at least initially two weeks of iv and then further oral i think he will be sensitive to linezolide the joint if you look at the x rays i think the joint is not going to get salvaged so i would just wait and watch also medial side i would not do anything if the medial side is not infected i would just leave it like that for the time being ankle looks reasonably when it's not falling apart so you don't need an external fixator or anything that i would just give him a slab and wait and watch so also you can put a wax dressing on the vancomycin that on the beads if required dr santosh would you like to offer your suggestions yes sir almost on uh, lines of what munit sir said so basically the very presence of an abscess which you drained and that picture although the parameters may still we need to treat it as an infected implant so i think you have uh, first thing already you have done you have removed the implant sir and now you have addressed the local thing also with your antibiotic beads anyways we got the culture report also only thing is yes i definitely would add a vac and nothing on the medial side and i'll wait for the time being until the wound settles down and see how it is going ahead but once I wound settles down would you plan for a bone grafting how would you address that large defect on the lateral side as well as non union of medial side yeah I just will uh, anyways we'll be mobilizing him in a cast so i think we'll continue with the cast him and see how we did for uh, weight bearing suppose if he is not doing well is symptomatic then i would try to uh, do something on the medial side sir otherwise i would continue mobilization with him as a cast or the walking cast ियन बल and exactly as dr pradeep and santosh said i just held on you can see there is a distinct gap in medial malleolus there is a big defect here this is after one and a half two months here you can see a lateral x ray nothing else is nothing else was done the fracture is already started healing and it is completely healed fracture and even the syndesmosis appears to have stabilized and nothing was done it just healed by itself so it was a bone forming mrs bone forming mrs yes bone forming mrs so this healed in spite of the in spite of the orthopedic intervention <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes yeah very interesting case sir very good case sir very good yeah thank you so thank nature cures excellent so converting an infected infected non union into a uninfected envelope bone is the most important thing create an uninfected envelope then nature can do its own job i think we have forgotten the art of wait and watch sometimes i think we are we are being surgeons we try to everything we want to intervene and we think we can make it better i think that's another thing as a message from this case sir thank probably one more message that we have we can have from this is probably high grade infection the retards union but low grade infection at times favors union So probably with a good job done by surgical debridement, addition of beads, probably the infection became wider. Probably it was a low grade infection, and probably that brought about a quicker healing in due course. Can I just tell you about this? What you are saying is there is a paper in two thousand nineteen. bacterial infections can trigger immune response which activates pro osteogenic pathways they are usually overshadowed by osteolysis because of active infection but there are two pathways that we have observed for years together but 2019 there is an experimental proof that application of killed bacteria produce significant bone formation at 4 weeks without lysis 
and relatively low dose of killed bacteria enhanced bone formation. So possibly when you do a very aggressive debridement and create an envelope, then it's possibly not low-grade infection, but killed bacteria is what the, the author says. This is published in 2019, uh, and uh, it's a very interesting paper. So please read that paper. Very interesting. Yeah, sir, sir, wonderful one, sir, sir. Can you give? Uh, can you record that reference? Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Straight. Sure. I'll just share it again for in a second. Role of back. Bacterial stimuli in inflammation driven bone formation. M. Courts and uh, at uh, et al. published in Netherlands European Cell and Material, volume 37, 2019, pages 402 to 419. A big paper. Very nice paper. Excellent. And quite relevant reference to this case, sir. Yes. That was interesting, sir. Yes. So, yes, sir. that brings yes, us to the webinar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have with us yes, Dr. Dr. Freda Kumar uh, on behalf of Orthopedic Surgeon Society of Andhra Pradesh would be giving a vote of thanks. Is Dr. Uday Kumar, sir, around? Yes, yes. I am not able to play my video. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Please yeah. hold on, sir. Please hold on. Uh, sir, good evening, everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Hi, ah, yes, sir, sir. Sir, good evening, everyone, especially to uh, Professor Sindhi, sir, and uh, whom I know. Uh, rest, of the, rest of the professors, especially Agassi, sir, I have seen many of his webinars. And, uh, sir, uh, on behalf of the Orthopedic Surgeon Society of Andhra Pradesh, and because our secretary is uh, traveling, He's on uh, air travel, you know, he's, from he's traveling from Bangalore to Vijayawada. So I'm taking the responsibility of uh, proposing vote of thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm uh, not able to hear you, sir, probably because uh, I'm, uh, I'm logged in from my iPhone. Because this uh, laptop is not uh, showing sir, me. Sir, we can hear you very well. Please continue, sir. We can hear you. Please continue. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, IOA and Dr. Ramesh Sen, uh, um, Professor uh, um, Atho Srivastava Ramchadda and our dynamic secretary Navin Tucker and uh, my sincere thanks to them and then for allowing us to conduct this uh, CME <laughs> together. I also would like to thank the Western Orthopedic uh, uh, Society headed by Professor Ajit Sinde and for giving us, uh, for uh, making us partners for the CME. And then uh, I would like to congratulate each and every uh, speaker because this is a A to Z around the trauma around the ankle and also 360 degrees coverage of the ankle, starting from the uh, Shushud Babulkar's uh, post malaria, then on to the trimalar fixation and then uh, terrace fixation. And I, and I am very happy that my student has uh, spoke on the biomechanics and my junior colleague Shivananda, though he took a long time, more than the time allotted, he has uh, dealt extensively about these uh, syndesmotic injuries. A, a very looks very small topic, but has given a very good detailed account of all these uh, injuries, especially how to how not to miss the injuries. And also, Agassi sir, once again for an excellent uh, uh, case uh, presentation. The last. Sir, always nature is always greater than anybody else. 
nature is always great sir once you leave it to the nature most of the things with that nature will take care of because in my i will uh, i have written a quotation on my my folder gopi folder we treat he cures we treat sir but he means uh, maybe god or maybe nature so that is the what uh, my i believe in that once again i thank all the faculty for their excellent talks and all the right uh, right uh, faculty for participating once again thank you for the opportunity thank you once again uh, all, all of you and uh, good night professor sindhe sir all the best sir for your coming elections and thank you everyone pradeep, thank you very much <laughs> and also pradeep munuth sir for the putan anchor society elections sir, tomorrow all the best sir thank you sir thank you so much Okay, so thank you everyone it is said that institutions are made up of by individuals and i can say webinars are made by vibrant and constructive discussions by yes, individuals who are institution in themselves and we were privileged and lucky today to have such individuals who are institutes in themselves on the behalf of web zone indian orthopedic association i thank you all for joining for this interesting webinar on injuries around the ankle also i thank the orthopedic surgeons association of andhra pradesh for agreeing to be the guest chapter thank you all and hope to see you back on next sunday have a pleasant bye. weekend bye everybody bye bye, bye. bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you so much. Best wishes bye. to everyone. Best wishes to Pradeep, Ramesh Shinde. All the Thank best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you bye. everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you, Professor Uday Kumar, sir. Thank you, sir. Ajit Shinde, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Deep, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye.